Bless the two foundations that have generously financed this series of talks resent the utter absence of my reference to the museum's archer because my material is pre-archer. I wish to, for about a minute or two, discuss the new base for the archer and the very top head of the archer. Uh, it may not be possible, but the magician in the slide projection booth or the image projection booth thought it might be possible to show you uh, the archer at this moment with the new base. But if that is not possible, I just wish to say that the, um, there's nothing on the screen, so you will have to keep this in your mind's eye, that very uh, deservedly indeed, the museum complements itself on the new base uh, given to uh, this brilliant little statue. But even though it has been publicized as style-free, uh, the base is not. Uh, while the previous support had a quaintly antiquarian aura, the present base is, in point of fact, after Brancusi, uh, taken from one of his birds in space. Uh, I sometimes wonder whether this inadvertent quotation was meant to furnish the wingless figure with a sense of flight. Um, my other uh, comment directed toward the archer is that in its new and very welcome placement on that base, one is ever more aware of the statue's superabundant antico-like locks uh, which are placed very close to the skull at one point, and they seem to be restrained before springing in release near the shoulder of the same figure. And I wonder, could these thick curls have once been held back by a gilt metal attachment in the classical style? If so, uh, might the archer's missing arrows also have been tipped uh, in that particular uh, medium. Well, let's return to um, the subject that I am officially dealing with, which of course is uh, the role of northern art, and particularly that of Schongauer in the art of Michelangelo. And I especially want to thank Caroline Kelly for her virtuoso Michelangelesque mastery of PowerPoint, without which I would be utterly helpless. Our a symposium, in keeping with the past century's key Freudian concerns, is devoted to an exploration of the artist's early years and their special significance. Let's compare the way in which Michelangelo's Renaissance biographers and his publicists presented aspects of that formative period with the way in which their subject in old age came to repeat the very views which they stressed. This radical shift is known from a much reprinted passage its source, a Roman dialogue spoken in the spiritual dialogue of Michelangelo's friend Vittoria Colonna. Taken at face value or at word value, Michelangelo's stinging denial of the value of transalpine imagery is at radical variance with the truth, at least as far as the role that that imagery played in his oeuvre. Why did Michelangelo, late in life, neg negate the role of northern art? What were the reasons for such revision and the significance of its circumstances? Both the very beginning and just beyond the ending of Michelangelo Buonarroti's achievements in art, these separate times focus upon the same small panel. Uh, one, uh, supposedly, his very, ver very first, which we'll see very shortly. What we see on the screen right now is the source of that first panel, 
and the initial stage toward creating his own uh, was actually a line drawing. This is uh, a Schongauer uh, rendering of the temptation of Saint Anthony. And that, uh, the painting by uh, Michelangelo, the very small painting now at Fort Worth, was actually probably placed uh, upon the uh, catafalque of Michelangelo, which you see in two different versions on the screen before you. So this little, uh, very small painting, uh, which you see on the left and on the right, the print source, uh, was uh, actually hung or held up at the time of the funeral ceremony in 1564. The catafalques versions which you just saw, this magnificent structure was erected for Michelangelo's funeral by the artists of Florence in 1564. Unprecedentedly grand for any creative figure, this temporary monument celebrated the city's collective genius as much as that of its recently deceased divinized master. Embalmed, Buonarroti's body, sent from Rome, had most obligingly released the sweet odor of sanctity. To produce Michelangelo's painted temptation, the northern engraving was placed before him by his older enigmatic friend, the painter Francesco Granacci, who went on to play a similarly stage-managing role throughout our artist's early days, also facilitating his career as sculptor. We've, of course, just learned so much about Granacci from Everett. Improving upon his black and white source, which you see on the screen at the right, Michelangelo, according to Vasari and according to his other biographers, studied the wonders of the Mediterranean deep. These bought at the Florentine fish market and their traits followed to add colorful verisimilitude to the young artist's monochromatic German source. Um, Michelangelo also furnished his sorely tempted saint with a long overdue halo, uh, which you can see at the left. Best known of Schongauer's prints, the eclectic early Saint Anthony was copied at least 10 times in engraved form. Uh, several of these, uh, like Michelangelo's panel, extended uh, their uh, rocky outcropping uh, along to the left to create a continuous land and sea uh, landscape and seascape. One of these, I think it's this one, was even worried about uh, poor St. Anthony's housing and pr provided a little hermitage along the bottom. Now one might wonder why the early Michelangelo and his Italian contemporaries so often turned to works by the same virtuoso northern engraver. No mere master of horror, Schongauer also exemplified gentler emotions. He provided graphic models for intricately realistic drapery and matchless presentations of biblical history in miniature. All these areas were needed by Renaissance artists as their rapidly classicizing references distanced them from the requisite appearance of the old time religion. With their wondrously Ikean microcosmic qualities seen in Schongauer's much copied Way to Calvary, which may actually go back to uh, a lost work of Jan van Eyck's, uh, biblical narratives such as this were so singularly comprehensive that if rolled up, uh, these prints could practically put uh, much of the New Testament and particularly the passion in your pocket. His crucifixion, uh, which you're going to, actually we're going to go back and back, perfect. Uh, Schongauer's crucif for crucifixion, which you see on the right, was copied in engraved form by a Florentine printmaker and contemporary of the young Michelangelo, Gerardo 
della Fora, and you see the Florentine copy on the right. And the same artist um, actually provided a um, pastiche, which you see here uh, in tondo form, after several of Schongauer's uh, engravings, uh, this particular one by Gerardo, probably dating around 1500 or into the very early 16th century. For what may be Buonarroti's first surviving religious statue, uh, a large polychrome nude wooden crucifix of about 1492, the one carved for Santo Spirito, he continued his consultation of the transalpine. This time, he adapted Schongauer's characteristic emphasis upon youthful features and slender, feminine, vulnerable forms. These qualities yielded a radically different uh, devotional experience, one at complete, uh, I would say, complete shift from the fiercely virile, far earlier Donatello crucifix uh, things go so fast that we've got to go back, and there is the Donatello crucifix, which most of you know for Santa Croce. Uh, this is a whole different world of suffering, uh, a different image world, a different age, a different reference from the one that Michelangelo was to produce about 80 or five or so years later. If indeed the Santo Spirito neo-Gothic Christ had been meant as a token of the artist's gratitude for anatomical research conducted in that institution, it's very strange indeed uh, that the image seemed like a denial of the very lessons found in the structure and dynamics of the body. There seems to be indeed uh, in Michelangelo himself a significant conflict between two worlds, those of knowledge and faith, of antiquity and Gothicism. Though Michelangelo could never forget the prophetic thunderings of the voice of San Venerola, his pietistic images were often spoken in a far gentler and surprisingly northern voice. When our artist went to Bologna in 1494, he again found himself in a center especially concerned with Schongauer's narratives. A similarly fantasiacal um, northward inclination uh, is found in this museum's primitivistic uh, little triptych uh, by Granacci. And you can see uh, in the Florentines' revival of the archaic uh, triptych formula, there is a medievalizing medieval mood uh, typical to Italian art of the detente. As most of you know, prior to uh, the sculptor's career, Michelangelo's father had apprenticed him to Domenico Ghirlandaio in 1487. And our uh, Saint Anthony that we looked at early on uh, was close to that date, uh, probably painted as Everett suggested when the artist was about 12 or 13. Now it's very interesting to note that uh, the artist that um, Michelangelo had been apprenticed to, uh, Gerlandio, was very much interested in Northern art himself. And this is, uh, his adoration of the shepherds for the Sassetti Chapel of Santa Trinita, painted in 1485 and very much influenced by uh, Hugo van der Goes' uh, adoration of the shepherds, which you see on the screen at the right. And this is part uh, of a extremely large Flemish triptych that had been ordered by a Medici banker in Bruges and sent to Florence in 1483. There the painting at the right, which you've all seen in the Uffizi probably, was installed in the Florentine Painters' Chapel of Sant'Egidio within the city's hospital church of Santa Maria Nuova. 
and was naturally very closely studied by uh, the city painters. Now I'm going to turn around and get a glass of water and excited to use glass. My wife said to speak loudly, and I shall follow her ever excellent words of wisdom. Now, prophets and sibyls were executed by um, Ghirlandaio in the Sassetti Chapel vault, just above the altarpiece, which you see at the left. And some of these may actually have been uh, participated in by the young uh, Michelangelo. And I'd like to suggest that an early work by Michelangelo may have actually been this tondo, which is now uh, in the National Gallery of Hungary uh, in Budapest. And there the speech scrolls and the pose that you see for the uh, St. John of Patmos, um, all of these are somewhat related to uh, models that were used by Ghirlandaio for the Sassetti Chapel. And I'm juxtaposing here um, a Schoengauer engraving of St. John on Patmos uh, at the right with the Michelangelo version of the same subject. And you can see how the foot sticking out in that rather ungainly fashion, uh, the uh, eagle uh, Michelangelo was never much of an animalier. Uh, the uh, seascape, which you see in the background, all of these could have been of some use to our artist uh, when he turned it into a tondo form. So it's, again, the pattern book coming into place. And you can see on the right is the uh, a Fort Worth painting, which has been so brilliantly cleaned by uh, Michael Gallagher, and the landscape on the left, and the seascape on the left, that all of these seem to be returning to a, a Gurlandai-esque formula. And that same formula you see a little bit in the background of the Sassetti father and son, which is here in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Now, if you look at the image at the left, uh, this rather tough, tan figure uh, is somewhat uh, similar in placement to some of the Sassetti Chapel figures, and I'm returning to the uh, St. John uh, on Patmos, in this instance, Cloudborn, that you see uh, by the Ghirlandaio a workshop, again, with a very uh, awkward eagle sort of stuck in there uh, from uh, a northern source. What's particularly interesting to me is the humanistic script, which you see in the Budapest uh, tondo uh, on the scroll, which is very much along the same Florentine lines that you find uh, in the early Vatican uh, Pietà which you see on the screen at the right. Now, as I've mentioned to you earlier, and you all know, Michelangelo uh, stressed his uh, loathing of Northern art, these uh, sentiments uttered uh, in the uh, very uh, spiritual erudite salon uh, of Vittoria Colonna. And these words were recorded by a young Portuguese hanger-on, Francesco da Holanda, who was allowed to attend these meetings. Uh, Vittoria, at this point, was a secular resident of a Silvestrine convent on Monte Cavallo, uh, where these meetings took place. And they also were attended by a uh, distinguished refugee from Medici despotism, and by Latanzio Tolomei, who was interested in the Reformation. And, um, I, well, I guess what we should do momentarily, I just wanted to juxtapose the Budapest Tondo on the left with the great Doni Tondo on the right, uh, which I think was painted about a decade later, which showed they had quite a way to go from the work at the left to the one at the right. Now, uh, let's just have a look and see uh, there is an image of Vittoria uh, by uh, her great friend Michelangelo, 
who um, led a very difficult and somewhat isolated life. She had a uh, sort of intense mutual admiration society with Michelangelo, but poor Vittoria had to endure his referring to her in totally masculine terms, as if any relation, relationship of his with a woman uh, called for uh, a sex change on her part. Uh, that same process, uh, we might almost say painful process, uh, was already in evidence uh, in the Sistine Chapel frescoes where the Cumaean Sibyl uh, comes closer to prophetic likeness than to that of a woman uh, gifted with divinely inspired uh, second sight. Uh, Vittoria uh, was herself uh, the widow of a military hero and a very successful Petrarchan poet of devotional verse. She triumphed uh, in many an area but for the visual arts. There, Colonna proved a complete klutz. Only she could have asked Michelangelo uh, to add more angels to the crucifixion he had drafted for her, uh, scrutinizing this work through a magnifying glass. Uh, similarly, Vittoria even had the temerity to demand of Titian that he paint more tears on a penitent Magdalene she had commissioned. But let's return to my a theme of primary interest. More than a blanket denunciation of Northern art, I believe Michelangelo's deceptively negative words deserve fresh consideration from several viewpoints. First, could his opinion not pertain primarily and justifiably to the tidal wave uh, of inferior transalpine art of the mid 16th century to that mass-produced deluge of a later Flemish Saint-Sulpicerie uh, and not to the magnificent early Netherlandish arts of his childhood, which was so important to his teacher and to his own early art. Secondly, as his negative view was in answer to Vittoria, might she not figure in his uh, stinging reply? Not only did that noble woman have the courage to ask Michelangelo how he viewed Northern art, she even told him she actually liked it. This, I think, really made the irascible old man have the perfect opportunity to put down one of his dearest friends along with the images she so mistakenly cared for. Vittoria herself, before fearing reprisals from the Inquisition, had favored aspects of the Reformation. So we might also think that her sympathy for transalpine theology and for Northern art may in fact have been closely interrelated, and I think we should perhaps keep that point in mind. Just why did the issue of Northern art's validity, having played such a dynamic role in much of his art, proved so threatening to the old Michelangelo. Why, by the time of this dialogue, when he was internationally celebrated and unprecedentedly well-paid, could he have ignored those pietistic commissions mostly undertaken in far earlier, hungrier times, executed before mastering the colossal male form divine? Had he forgotten a Madonna ordered for Bruges in 1504. This too betrays a close study of Netherlandish pietism, reflecting bittersweet images by that art center's leading painter, Gerard David. It stresses a, the David stresses a rocky center uh, for the rest on the flight into Egypt. I think uh, the painter, from Bruges included this unyielding feature to point to death and entombment. So original a support was repeated by Michelangelo, below the Madonna he sent to Bruges. More famous, an early mother and son, again with northern patronage, the Vatican Pietà of 1498-1499, as we all know, was based upon a Gothic devotional formula. 
And of course, this was demanded by his French patron. Uh, on the left, uh, Mary's eternally youthful features, once again Schongauer-esque, uh, referred to the recent Vatican emphasis upon uh, the Immaculate Conception. Lastly, in terms of trying to understand Michelangelo's shift in views, I think that even more than a put down of poor Vittoria, his late rejection of transalpine religious art stemmed from the refashioning of his Roman life along monumentally, relentlessly masculine lines. Even so revered a figure as Raphael had never felt the need to sever transalpine sources for northern related commissions, as you can see uh, in the uh, St. George at the left uh, for the Urbinate recipient of the Order of St. Garter or for the French royal uh, recipient of the Order of St. Michael, which you see in the Raphael on the St. of the uh, 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 Order of St. Michael. So I think um, our artists' revision of Flemish values and their rejection came as a consequence of reconfiguring himself along neoclassical and what we call today homosocial lines. Small, old, and ugly, Michelangelo had outed himself in passionate poetry uh, addressed to his beautiful Roman boyfriend of the far, far younger and requisitely aristocratic Tommaso Cavalieri. Such lines and sentiments, though by then probably tolerated in Florence, were still safer in Rome when inscribed under papal protection. Past master of terribilita, uh, the mature artist prided himself upon striking terror in the hearts of poets and monarchs alike by sheer genius and pure ego. Uh, but for his personal uh, spiritual funerary images, such as the one on the right, uh, these so different from uh, the uh, so-called slaves that you see at the left, Michelangelo had ever less use for the pietistic spirit of his early devotional works. Any questions inadvertently returning our artist back to early years of compromise and transalpine dependency could only come as threats to the very values of his hard-won success. Those compassionate images of northern inspiration so key to early triumphs were now equated by Michelangelo with the weaknesses of women. Failure of his mother's life or her lactation as he would observe with keenest explicatory satisfaction had led to his nursing by a stonecutter's wife, so bringing marble uh, into his very first nurture. For our symposium, devoted to the early years of Michelangelo, among its most significant factors, that the very womanliness found in that early period, he would later work so very hard to erase from his art, his life, and from his very memory. Thank you.